It takes two generations to erase a history. More than just a warning, it is the makings of the message and mission of today's musical guest, paying homage to an esteemed lineage of spiritual songs and soul singers, Kita P's sound ignites heart-centered, self-reflective fire and compels us all to be keepers of the flames. Joined today with her smooth groove band, Black Licorice, Kita P is bringing a special flavor to the B-side stage, better than sugar, and just the right amount of spice. Tonight, I am your host, Queen God Is, urging you to adjust your speakers and kick back in your seats. Get your moms right for all of this heat. Keep it close. Men are looking at a hundred thousand to fight them. 
And through military maneuvers, misinformation, the enemy wasn't prepared to deal with what you're facing. He said that we make more of a difference than when we are hesitant. Hesitating to demand the things we were heaven sent. Like respect, so stay aware of the movement and protest this. You'll keep fighting and stay militant. Now stay militant. Goodwin, that was featured. Yes, it is February 2018. We are oh, at B-Side Brick Studios. People have been celebrating, commemorating uh, love. Um, it is Black History Month. The movie Black Panther comes out um, for many people tonight and for most people tomorrow. And you audience could be anywhere in the world because of all of these, th these things and you chose to be here with us tonight. So give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> I introduce you to singer, songwriter, musician, media host, fierce self-promoter, oh, and oops. my fellow Wakandan. Oh. I'm just gonna go ahead and claim it. Oh, Kita wow. P, give her a round of applause one more time. <laughs> For those of you who know her, you often see her with her guitar traveling around the New York City performance circuit and beyond. Um, but tonight she is joined by awesome musicians, Black Licorice, and this song, Adewa, featuring Goodwin. So I would love for you to just go into introducing them, oh. telling us briefly just about how you connected with them, and then how did Goodwin get on this song? Oh, okay, great. Um, well, this is my band, Black Licorice. Um, there are many iterations, and um, at the moment, these guys have been rocking with me for the longest. Um, and right here, you have Michael on keys. Hey, Michael. He's the funny guy. Um, he tells a lot of jokes. And um, I met him actually at an um, open mic that my friend Marcos um, hosts called One Mic Night. And I also met Osei there. And they're in awesome. a band together called um, Ruckus. Okay. And um, they used to be the house band. So I started like just jamming with them and then asked them if they could play with me. And then I met Dave through a mutual friend, um, and Dave is on drums. Um, hey, Dave. Yeah. A musical old head who moved back down south, but um, I was looking for a drummer for a while, and then he, he was like, hey, I got, your, I got a drummer for you that is available. And so me and Dave clicked, and yeah. So this is Osei, by the way. Sorry, yeah. I didn't say his actual name. So Michael Osei, Dave. And then we have Goodwin, who is from Ghana. I like to say that all the time. Um, but yeah, he is um, a co-write. Um, he produced the track Adwa. He actually approached me saying that he wanted to do an album of his own. And um, then I asked if he could work on a song with me as well. And um, I told him that I really like history and I have this idea. Mm -hmm. And he had um, all these, like a cache of beats. Mm -hmm. And so we just went from there. And then he also built around it. So part of the line is Black Seeds and Fertile Sand, right, from the song? Mm -hmm. um, what's the other half of that line? Black Seeds and Fertile Sand, the needs. Uh, the needs to take a stand. Yeah. I think I got it. Okay, good. And Adwa, what does it mean? Um, well, Adwa is about the Battle of 1896 in um, a place called Adwa that's now, like, Ethiopia. Okay. But basically, Menelik II um, and his wife Batul in 1896, they gathered 100,000 men, which he says in his rhyme, mm -hmm. um, and they defeated the Italians that were trying to come and invade and, um, and colonize. And that was in 1896. And it's just significant because a lot of places were colonized, um, the whole continent, the whole world, basically. And um, they were able to defeat, and it was a black leader, Menelik mm -hmm. II. And um, yeah, I think that's what is most interesting that. It's, that's something that's not really well talked about, so. Right, and I think that's really timely for a lot of reasons. Um, but a lot of times when we think about history, particularly black history, there's a lot of degradation and losing, right? There's this 
theme of losing mm -hmm. um, or being oppressed, um, but there's lots of winning. Yeah. And this is a good time for winning because we have this feature film coming out called Black Panther. We are by no means hired by Marvel to do <laughs> the plug. However, I do feel like it's very fitting and it's very exciting. And like I said, the audience could be making their way to go see that, but they're here. Yeah. Um, what is it about triumph in terms of your history, our history, that you really want, that inspires you to really infuse that message into the song? Like, what did you want the audience to know? Well, I think it's um, my love of history. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I don't know all of history, but I, I am intrigued by it. Mm -hmm. um, I am intrigued and I do research and I, um, I love how one of my friends said it the best, like the archive is always changing in the sense that your history is always changing. Like you'll mm -hmm. learn something when, you, when you're growing up and then you educate yourself and you realize it's something else. And so that happens a lot in history. And, um, uh, and so that's what kind of intrigues me, you know, things that I thought were one thing. And like, just this is an easy example because it comes up in my head just so easily, but it's just like Christopher Columbus. Like mm -hmm. we're taught so much, but the archive is actively changing. Um, I feel like when it comes to history and, you know, like who owns it? And right now I think it's up for grabs. And so I, I honestly do think that way. And so, I mean, this is like a, a point in history and songs are memorable. And if it is like really good, it will, it will like resonate and it will be around even after I'm around. Mm -hmm. So hopefully somebody after I'm around will, you know, be educated and be interested in that song and like, oh, 1896. You know. Do you feel like musicians are historians in a way, um, or at least some musicians who, who choose to be? And do you think that it's important for musicians to make a decision to try to include elements of documentation uh, and, co and commentary in their work? I think it, just living life in general, you are your own like storyteller. I don't know how else to explain it. Like, I don't think it's up to artists. I mean, I do. I do take it upon myself to just have like a, a real message in most of my songs and music, but I, I don't think it's up to the artists. Like a lot of people might think that, but sometimes people just want to be free and like just make a song to make a song with no feeling behind it, mm -hmm. but it will resonate with someone else and won't really have a message. It might just be about the beat or something, or it really will have a message, but you don't resonate with it, but somebody else does. So, <coughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of resonance, uh, history has a resonance, and when it does not resonate, meaning it was not told properly or it was revised, we have the ability to remix and remake it um, and create new narratives and stories. Let's go into the next song, which is actually called History, yes. um, and it's featuring real Ishmael. Well, actually... On the song, in the recording. Um, yeah. But he's mm -hmm. not going to be in the audience with us tonight. But okay. let's give him a round of applause for Goodwin one, one more time as we go into the next song. History by Tita P and Black Lish Licorice B side. <laughs> Thank you. takes two generations to erase a history so i sing for the free so my kin can see third eye is wide by this blind fire so i sing for the free so my kin can know peace beware killer cops on the block that will shoot you down in the street beware the brothers on the corner that will do just about anything to eat. Beware of those dudes in the suit. I swear they perpetrate everything from the drugs on your block to the knowledge they omit when teaching your seed. It takes two generations to erase a history. So I sing for the free so my kin can see. Third eye is wide by this blind So my can can know peace. Understand this 
systematic attack on us people. Worse when you are black, the world is evil. Watch the cream cruise, cause cash rules everything around us. The face of our master, decay in the masses. While prisons make bank, the individual loses rights. Oh, to Telling you all, all, all falls down. Thank you. We quoted this song at the top of the show. Uh, it takes two generations to erase a history. And then you go on to add, so I sing for the free so my kin can see. I sing for the free so my kin can know peace. Right. That amount of time, is that actual documented the, the two generations before things start to? No, it's probably not. Mm -hmm. I, like, I hear a lot of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I looked it up and I, was, I saw, you know, a bunch of different uh, numbers. But you know what? We're in a generation of uh, selective amnesia, and, <laughs> you know, so sometimes it's five days, you yeah, know. That's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how did you come up with that line, and what drew you to it? Um, so there was like a moment, um, probably like three years ago, especially during like a lot of the protests in the city against like police brutality, um, where I was just really feeling it, you know, like I woke up black, you know, and I was like, oh, God. Um, so, <laughs> is that the general consensus? Like every day, every day that you wake up black. Is no, that it's a, it's just okay. like, no. I just woke up. I, it's just a phrase. I, I mean, you know, yes. you know, my comment. we got it. But um, <laughs> but um, no, I was just uh, feeling like a lot, really feeling very heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was also reading a lot because I was doing this um, one-page splash page um, website for my old job about um, Black history. Um, and so I just started like looking into different things and I came up with this kind of song through all that time and you know all those things happening and as well as like um, uh, I watched this thing called Hidden Colors and so yeah. I think in earshot I think one of the people on the on that um, mentioned that it takes two generations but you really got to look things up after you watch that like mm -hmm. you can't mm -hmm. take it for face okay. value. Got it. <laughs> um, you've been classified by many and, and also by yourself as being uh, R&B, soul, folk, with hip-hop influences. How would you feel if someone threw in um, a, a, a vocalist who does protest songs? Would you, do you think that that's fitting, um, especially to help uh, qualify some of the songs that have strong messages and that are kind of have an activist feel to them? Sure, yeah. yeah. I think that's pretty fitting. Have you done a lot of research about protest music? Is that something that you've studied? And no, I actually haven't mm -hmm. studied it per se, but I do like um, some protest music, and I don't remember a lot of the um, artist names, mm -hmm. but there's one that always comes to mind. It's called The War of the Workers. Mm -hmm. That I always, like, just, just the chorus is always in my head, mm -hmm. um, but I'm always at work, so. Yeah. I asked this question, you're always at work, which we're going to come back to what work is. If you're not doing this, we definitely want to know what you are doing. Um, we are in generation quote unquote woke. Mm. I try not to say that word every day, but I hear it every day. And for many people, they grew up in a household that raised them to be awake. And so they got it through um, some 
parental figure or some role model that was close by. A lot of people, some people, however, go through school and then they have that college class where they start learning these vocabulary terms or meet that one teacher who's really just fed up and wants to tell the truth about things <laughs> and then they get woke a little bit later in life. What's your relationship with that term? Um, and how does the idea of being woke connect with the concept of being self-reflective or the process of being self-reflective? Um, I don't, I mean, I think a lot of people are saying the term woke, but I don't always agree that they're like a woke person, yeah. of course. Yeah, um, you know, and it depends on the day. They may be awake today, but tomorrow they may be asleep. Nap time. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it depends on the subject yeah. as well. Um, but for me... Um, Do you use the term to, to refer to yourself? Not no. Really. Okay, cool. I sort of prefer but what gives sleep. you your consciousness? Yeah. Of, you know, what gives you your consciousness, and then how does that relate to your self-reflection? So I'm constantly on this battle, and I don't talk about it a lot with like a lot of people, but maybe with some close friends, but like just to have like inner peace, because mm -hmm. I... I I honestly just don't know what that's like mm -hmm. and you know if it's not another thing it's something else in this world and especially living in New York or just living in this life like um, you know our resources are very much being limited um, and, and you know as the days go on and also just knowing myself and being fearless within because then I can I can actually manifest everything that I want to do mm -hmm. so I mean that's the biggest thing that's really um, if if I want to be considered woke at any time, it's the moments where I'm actually digging deep within mm -hmm. rather than like interacting and stuff. So it's not really driven by your awareness of the different causes of the world or the different issues of the world, but really your goal for inner peace. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of peace, a lot of musicians, and particularly musicians who grace this stage, help bring peace to many people including the audience members who actually sit in the room. When so many things are going on, we, we, we try to find the artist that helps us to chill out, to relax, to self-reflect, to heal. Um, and you are the first artist of all of the episodes that I've hosted where I got a text message one month before your show from a friend slash colleague of yours who's another artist and also a fan. And the text message said, key to P, the artist who's about to be on your show in a month is amazing. Yeah. And, and the reason why, one, I just wanted to share that with you so you could receive that. Yeah, um, and the reason why that's special is because we know that artists can be very competitive sometimes. <laughs> they can be uh, jerks. <laughs> and, um, you know, they're human. We're human, so we're going through the ebbs and flows of life. And sometimes that makes us not able to really take each other in acknowledge each other. So for another artist, I'm going to give him a shout, shout out. His name is Kyle Shedrick. He's a singer, vocalist Aww. himself who's really talented. And he took it upon himself to send me this message to say that you really, really are amazing. Uh -huh. How does it feel when people compliment and critique your work? Um, it, it feels like I'm actually doing something, you know. Um, I'm, I do feel like, I feel like there's more purpose and um, it also kind of gives me um, affirmation I feel like to like continue mm -hmm. in this journey of music because um, I've thought about giving it up uh, a few times. Mm -hmm. What's your best compliment that you've received? Um, I think you've changed like people's <laughs> chakras in this room or something. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember it. They were straight for the cosmos. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. And what was your harshest critique? Um, Maybe I blocked them all out. I have no idea. Um, yeah, I can't. Rem I like don't want to be that person, but I can't. All right, good. Remember. And that might be a good thing. <laughs> we block out all of the harsh critiques. Let's get ready to go into the next song with Kita P and Black Licorice. Give it up for them one more time. So, hello, hello. So this is a new new song.
as I am Caught up in the pettiness of my thought I am Thinking about everything that could go wrong I am Stuck in this place I am Looking for a means to escape I am I am from the silences and I am avoiding everything that's within and I am losing faith I am looking for means to escape I am cause I am cause I am Losing myself all the time. I sit and I run away from my own mind and I cry on the inside. Sometimes in this life, I know there's more than just this, yeah, but I'm afraid of what exists, yeah. I'm afraid of what's within I'm afraid of what's within Cause I am in the pettiness of my thought I am thinking about everything that could go wrong I am stuck in this place I am looking for a means to escape I am cause I am running cause I am considered two of the most powerful words and, and the most powerful phrase of all of life. Um, there's this idea that whatever you put after the statement I am becomes your manifestation, right? So we have to be careful about our statements using I am in the beginning part of it. You are from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And you made your way to Brooklyn or to New York. Yeah. After, shortly after that. How did you, what was that transition? Um, so, um, I knew I wanted to leave my hometown and it wasn't like, it just wasn't for me. Like there's no jobs really. And the art scene wasn't really kicking. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I got accepted to a school that had a campus in LA and New York. So I spent my first year in LA and mm -hmm. I didn't like it. And so I wanted to be closer to my family. So I, um, transferred to the New York campus and then finished school here. Was it music school? It was a conservatory, musical mm -hmm. theater. So I actually studied musical theater. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're going to come back to that, uh, talking about being an independent artist with a background, with, with your training is, and um, how that impacts the work. But let's um, go back to this I am thought. Mm -hmm. um, so let's finish two statements. The first one is I was. I was. Um, like just, just in, like, I was. Yeah, any, like if you could think pre-New York, pre-Key to P music, uh, um, now. I was. Uh, I was a way more vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, as an as an individual uh, when it came to the world and just 
eating everything up, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, with no filter. Got it. So. And now I am? More filtered. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like with the <laughs> things that people bring into my life or the, the people that come in, like mm -hmm. I'm definitely more filtered because you can't let everybody in. So. Mm -hmm. And Brooklyn is? Brooklyn is? Gentrification on steroids. <laughs> That's what it is. But it's a lovely place. I mean, I really do. I love it here. I have it. I've been here since 2006. So yeah, I think that that kind of is the running motto: Brooklyn gentrification on stero steroids. But it's a lovely place. Um, <laughs> uh, in 2012, you released your, I guess, your first EP, yeah. four songs, named Key to uh, Self Titled yeah. Key to P. Um, and very different from the recent project, which was released August 2017, called The Lesson. Yes. Very different style, very uh, similar content to a the degree as far as, far as like, uh, some of the self-reflective material. Uh, but the sound, the quality, the, of course, everything has grown. Speaking of growth, when you talk about being able to receive compliments from people who are moved by your work or find a sense of peace in it, but also being able to block harsh critique. Somewhere between the praise and the critique is a middle ground that I think most of us try to strive to, to, to you know, operate from. What is that middle ground for you and how do you use it to grow? Not only, as, I guess, as a human being, but specifically as an artist. Um, so the the, it actually is a like the middle ground for me is like um, measuring the two like two qualities that just always come up or um, so it's my patience and my ego. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have much patience for myself, so mm -hmm. I've been really practicing having patience for myself because it'll help me have patience for the rest of the world and the things that are going on around me because mm -hmm. I'm I don't necessarily want instant gratification, mm -hmm. but I definitely um, you know you spend hours rehearsing or practicing and then you mess up that one lick that you sure. really wanted um, or mm -hmm. that one note or whatever. Um, so that's something that um, is more of a middle ground. If my patience is, patience is, you know, together, if I'm really by my patience, that's a middle ground. And then also not to fully get rid of my ego, but to kind of just let it die down on its own and not feed into it because, you know, um, Artists uh, all over, especially in this city where I'm currently um, living, it's um, it's kind of like a rat race. We're all like we're we're, we're a community. We're we're um, yeah, we're a community, and we're building each other. But it's still like it's still hard because you you want you want so much more. You want to make money. You wanna mm -hmm. you wanna you know make this your full time thing. But it's just it's really hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, not to say that no one can do it. I mean, anybody can do it. It's just, um, I think there's amount of sacrifice. And, um, and I think that um, with my ego, I, I try to check it as often as possible. I mean, I'm not always the best, I am human. But when I, when I hear like somebody that is just really killing it, or I just hear a band, I always mm -hmm. make sure that I try to go out of my way to compliment them, mm -hmm. um, to let them know that I was listening. Um, the other mm -hmm. day I was um, at Savannah's and then a show ended, but another guy went on, but nobody was really paying attention mm -hmm. to him. And I stopped and took a listen and he was really good. And I just complimented him and sent him a message. And he was like, this means a lot if just one person is listening. and like. Um, mm -hmm. Just like checking my ego at the door and then working on my patience is like a middle So ground. patience, ego, mo ego modification. Yes. Um, and really being present to, to listen. And I think when we're present to take other things in, it helps us not go to the default place, which may be to compare and to compete. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to stop on that note because I feel like that's a really difficult but powerful set of messages. And I want the audience and myself and you all to let that digest. <laughs> um, but as we digest that, we're gonna come back after this next song and talk more about this incredible patience that you actually have. A lot of people may not know that you have something called Key to P Music Sessions. And as an artist who's really growing and like who wants to achieve your next level of success, you've created a space to really be present to and honor other musicians. Um, as an artist who's, who does that herself, um, I, I know that it's rare but powerful. And so we're going to talk about Key to P Music Sessions. But right now, we're going to go into the next song, which is Volcano. Volcano. Awesome. Give it up.
to erupt Watch what you say to me, babe Ooh, hush the hell up You got a lot of nerve to tell me how I feel You got a lot of nerve to tell me what I know You remind me of something I don't want to remember oh, 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 you remind me of something I don't want Something, something kind of stank. You remind me of something I don't want to remember. Get the hell up out my face. You remind me of something I don't want to remember. I can't thank you. Remind me of something I don't want to remember. For us, baby, who it's got us both stuck. You know what you deserve, you know what I deserve. You know what you deserve, you know what I deserve. You remind me of something I don't want to remember. Oh, 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 you remind me of something I don't want to remember. Something I don't want to remember Get the hell up out my face You remind me of something I don't want to remember I can't thank you Remind me of something I don't want to remember Black Licorice, who just put something, something kind of stank on this song. Mm -hmm. So in a good way, we want to give y'all a shout out again. <laughs> um, this song is called Volcano. Yes. <laughs> this song is called Volcano. 
which is a perfect segue into one of the producers' questions for this evening about black women. A lot of times black women in general are pushed to edit themselves, to shrink themselves, to lower themselves. And then when you think about black women in music or in the arts, that kind of exacerbates that whole conversation. How has that been for you? In what ways have you shrunken, if any? In what ways have you expanded as a black um, person in music? In music, particularly, I, I think like the the ways I felt shrunken were like um, just with getting shows and um, just the way people would talk to me, certain certain like promoters or something. But I, um, but what I did to kind of regain my power is like. Like, um, like, say a promoter wasn't paying, but I knew they were getting paid off of the gig that I was performing off of. Like, now I've taken it into my own hands. I want to start curating my own events so that mm -hmm. I know that um, things will, you know, happen for me the way that I need, you know, mm -hmm. and the way that I wanted to manifest. So I do think that for um, black women, it's all about, like, I don't know, I think it's just reclaiming yourself, just saying, like, no, I'm not going to take this. And, mm -hmm. you know, and there's certain moments where you just, like, you pick and choose your battles because it's really not always worth it. But um, for me, I, I think that um, you know more than anything, I'm the one who silences myself, mm. even when other people, you know, when it can be deemed that other people are silencing. Because I, I know that I still have the power to speak up and say certain things. Um, it's all, you know, it's it's like um, it's like a, a growth that sure. I'm going through. And that's very human and very universal, no matter who you are, where you come from, there are these things that happen within us that cause us to to kind of truncate, you know, to, to go inward, to become smaller. Um, and then we learn through a series of life events how to shed that, hopefully we learn. Um, the other part of that question was, in what ways have you expanded? But I'm gonna go ahead and add this in there. Uh, you've said that at 23 years old, you had what was, what you call a vocal breakthrough. And I kind of think of that as an expansion. You said that you felt like you were in a studio working on a song and you felt like after you had um, just really kept redoing some, some vocals and were being pushed by whoever was in the studio with you, that you really felt like you could sing or do anything. That is Describe true. that moment. Um, actually, it was really interesting because I wasn't like, I really wasn't doing anything, actually. Um, like I, I was just starting to pursue my music, mm -hmm. if, um, if that makes sense. Like, um, and I linked up through Craigslist uh, with these two amazing guitarists from Trinidad, and, and they they really played their guitars like more rhythm, mm -hmm. so it really gave a lot of like um, freedom vocally. Mm -hmm. And they came over with their equipment, and they were like, "We're recording," and um, I had this one song, and I literally just sang my heart out and. It got to a point where, um, you know, like I couldn't stop like tears from coming, but it wasn't like bad or anything. I just, I felt, I, I felt like that was like the closest to my true self I've ever gotten. Mm -hmm. um, like other people might say the closest to God, mm -hmm. but like the closest to my true self mm -hmm. um, in those moments, mm -hmm. especially like on stage, especially singing. But in that moment in particular, um, I like had this blink of a moment or a flash mm -hmm. moment as well within that experience like I can do anything mm -hmm. um, and so that's what it was like they just told me to like sing mm -hmm. and I was like you can't record in my apartment I don't have anything set up they opened the window mm -hmm. and everything and it sounded great to me like mm -hmm. I still play this song I mean I never released it but I still play it um, just as a reminder and that's really special and I do want to offer that to all of the other musicians who may be watch watching now or later is that if your own music can't find a place within you that it opens up for you outside of the career path or the music itself, then there's something to think about there. So I think that, that I just want to acknowledge that's really special that the music does that for other people, but it really did that for you beyond the music. Is yeah. that what it sounded like? All right, um, well, speaking of black women, I'm gonna continue with the theme of black. Um, let's talk about the black god pantheon. What is that? Um, so I describe Black Out Pantheon as a group of black artists in the city, um, and also not in the city, because uh, of Branson, uh, who are, they do different, we do different things. We sing, there's um, rappers, there's writers, there's playwrights, there's actresses, there's uh, musicians, 
And basically, we are a collective. We're meant to support each other and use our work for truth to power. A lot of the people, I think majority of the people in Black God Panther and Beyond, mm -hmm. and I think it's seven of us, are educators in some capacity right. for the, like the next generation. So we have myself, we have Precious Gorgeous, he's also in the audience over here. Hi. Um, and Krim Della. Krim Della, mm -hmm. and um, AKA Black Zeus. And we have Ashley Awuzi, who's an actress, and some of her movies are on Netflix. Um, Branson, mm -hmm. he is um, a visual artist more so, and he is based in Washington. And then Anson, who was mm -hmm. meant to be here this evening, mm -hmm. um, uh, who couldn't make it. But, um, yeah. and then we have Rashim, who does uh, beats and does writing and you know is a back-end guy, but he's really supportive. So. Well, hello to all of y'all. I love name dropping, especially like dope people who people would otherwise have not heard of. I think that's really great. Um, the next song that we're going to go into is called Dream, but segue into the idea of dream, which means a lot of things for many of us. It is many people's dream to be an artist that feels supported and is also connected to other artists and you connected them through this collective Black God Pantheon but you also connect to other artists through a mission of yours which is called Key to P Music Sessions which is a very generous way to share the platform with bassists and guitarists, fellow musicians um, and you sing a song that they choose and then you swap roles um, well, you, you, you go from behind the mic to kind of like uh, interviewing, interviewing yeah. and hosting them. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, Key to P Music Sessions, when we come back from this called Dream, Key to P and Black Licorice. I don't care, I don't, I'm fine with that. <laughs> Sounds way better. Just 
your homework. You're gonna go on YouTube and you're gonna find footage perhaps from 2008 of a short-haired budding artist who was singing one of her first original songs called One Mic at a Little Cafe. Um, and then you fast forward 10 years, a decade later, um, into this fresh EP called The Lesson of this long-haired bouquet of an artist um, with a lot on the horizon. If your current self could give a quick one word message to your 2008 self, what would it be? The lesson is fearlessness. Fearlessness. Yeah. Just don't be scared. You know, uh, there's a lot of things that I was like scared of, like um, for a very long time. But once I broke through, I'm, you know, just day at a time. But yeah. That's so good. on this day, Black History Month, Black History Timelessness, timelessness <laughs> we offer you reflection and fearlessness. Oh, and I think that's yes. a great way to wrap up a show. Please go home and do your homework, find out more. She has a thousand videos, including the Key to P music sessions, where she interviews other artists, and they're really well done, and I really appreciated them, and I trust that you will too. All right? Thank and you. that said, that brings us to our close. Key to P and Black Liquors, potent yet delicate, soothing yet fiery, full of sweetness and bitter truths. We have arrived at that moment in the show where a good simile is in order. Tonight was like a good Brooklyn stroll through the botanic gardens at the enlightened moment when the cherry blossoms are on the cusp of full bloom and full shed translation. Thank you, Kita P and Black Licorice for taking us somewhere special yet accessible, for celebrating both growth and change, beauty and fragility, and for reminding us to use our time and our gifts wisely. Speaking of gifts, we have more in store for you, of course. To unwrap episodes of B-Side, check us out on YouTube using the hashtag B-SideBK, or enjoy our podcast at soundcloud.com slash B-Side Podcast. I am your host, Queen God Is, wishing you all wisdom, wonderment, and Wakanda forever. We love you, Brooklyn. Till next time. <laughs>
a dream is right here to keep us united doubt is forever gone happy I could be so